Hey, how's it going, guys? So 10.2 is here, and with it, a few changes for Affliction. So I felt like it was a perfect time for me to make an updated guide for Affliction and Mythic Plus. You guys seem to really enjoy my last guide, and I really appreciate all the feedback and all the support that's come from that last guide. So thank you guys so much. We almost hit 2,000 subscribers on the YouTube, which is crazy. I don't know where we're at when this comes out, but thank you guys so much for all that. So... With that said, Affliction is my favorite spec in the game, if you haven't already noticed, and it's my favorite to play. So I hope that even though it's not the easiest or what most people would think is the best spec, that I can help you guys out in this guide and see if you like it for yourself and see what you can do with it. Part of it for me is I love to see how I can do with a spec that isn't as good that most people think is, is garbage. That's part of what I enjoy. If you wanna stay up to date on all things Affliction, be sure to hit that subscribe button, come by the Twitch, twitch.tv slash arson. I'm gonna be doing Affliction Keys all season. All the things in here are things that I tested myself on the PTR over the past month and have been doing as much testing as I possibly can to get you guys information for this guide. So things can change, things might change. So again, if you wanna stay up to date, be sure and come by the stream, subscribe, all that good stuff. In this guide, I'm gonna go over the changes to Affliction 10.2, the new tier set, stats and gear, how I send for Mythic Plus, talents, rotation, my UI, and lastly, just some general tips and tricks. If you did see my last 10.1.5 guide, I did go over tips and tricks for Warlock and Affliction Warlock in every single dungeon. That's going to be a separate video, so be sure to subscribe like I already said, or come by the Twitch where I'm going to be gathering all that information for you guys and for myself, but to share with you guys. So, let's jump right into it. In 10.2, Affliction hasn't really seen too many changes, and overall, we're kind of in a rough spot. I do certainly love the spec and the playstyle, and I'm going to continue to play it. But with that said, there are a couple things we can talk about and the new tier set bonus, which is fantastic. I wish we would have seen a couple talent changes or at the very least maybe we're somewhere located. I'm looking right at you, Pet Sack. Uh, the first change though is really good since it's tied to our tier set and just kind of smooths everything out a bit more. Solar's Gluttony is now a 30 second with two points or a 15 second with one point, which will always be taking two points in my opinion. Before it was tied to UA ticks and most of the time it would cause a desync between Volatate and Soul Rot, especially if like your UA target was dying or whatever, which was a little annoying to play around. Now, Vile Taint and Soul Rot have the exact same cooldown, which makes our rotation feel way smoother and easier to play around our new tier bonus. I'll touch on this in the rotation section since it does change things a little bit, but we're already gonna be playing the entire Soul Rot row now, so it doesn't really matter. This is just a solid quality of life change. Also, before jumping into the tier set, I talked briefly in one of my previous videos about this. However, they did fix an issue where our tier set would only increase the initial damage of Seed of Corruption to our main target instead of hitting all targets. That is fixed. However, there is still currently an issue where if you're running Sow the Seeds, only one, your initial seed, is buffed by the 60%, not the additional two seeds are buffed by the 60%. So hopefully that gets changed, maybe by the time this guide is out, but at the time of making this, only your initial seed gets the amp, the other two do not. With that said though, our new two piece is Soul Rot damage is increased by 15% and lasts four additional seconds. And our new four piece is Soul Rot grants three Umberfire Kindling, which increase the damage of your next Malefic Rapture to deal 50% increased damage, or your next Seed of Corruption to deal 60% increased damage. Additionally, Umberfire Kindling causes Malefic Rapture to extend the duration of your damage over time effects and haunt by two seconds. The new tier bonus has seen a couple changes since the PTR came out, and I'm actually a really big fan of it since it does include the dog extension, which was something I mentioned in my wishlist video. And I still hope to see this as a baseline talent someday, but until then, having a choice between single target damage and AoE damage in Mythic Plus around something that is only a third second cooldown, in my opinion, feels really fun to play around. Our last one was fine, but it really kind of just felt really lackluster and you just got extra damage whenever you Vile Tainted, so what? The new set does have a pretty big impact on what talents we play since it means more soul rots, more tier set activations like I kind of mentioned before. We're kind of always going to be running Soul Eater's Gluttony in my opinion now. And I think having Dark Harvest is even better. We did lose our class trinket which was a decent amount of damage but it essentially means we're not so reliant on Dark Lair for 2 minutes and we're more of a 30 second class which in Mythic Plus is actually pretty good. With that said, they did nerf the class trinket a little bit. Essentially they increase its duration by 10 seconds but they cut its primary stat granted by 50%. So initially we will continue to run the class trinket with Dark Glare, but once you start getting some of the better trinkets online, which I'll talk about later in the stats and gear section, 
we will probably switch out that class trinket as soon as we can and no longer run Dark Lair, in my opinion. And speaking of that, there was also a change to Grand Warlock's design. They changed it for every single spec, but the one for Affliction is uh, it's just a flat 30 seconds off of Dark Lair now instead of based on how many shards you spend. And they did that for every major summon of Warlock. We never really ran Grand Warlock's design anyways. This is actually probably a decent buff for Grand Warlock's design for Affliction, considering most of the time, even if you did play it, you would only ever really take about 30 seconds off it anyways because our shard generation is significantly lower, in my opinion, than other the other two specs. But Grim Warlock's design does not feel good at all to play, and I haven't even been playing with Dark Lair on the PTR anymore at all. Okay, so I want to start the section off with a normal disclaimer. Eye level is almost always better in every situation, especially if it gives you main stat. So definitely take those. But be sure to sim your character to find out other information. I'm going to go over exactly how I like to sim for Mythic Plus in the next section. So jumping right into it, Haste mastery for everything. If you're crafting anything, if you're picking up loot from dungeons or raid or whatever, we want haste mastery, as much haste mastery as we can possibly get. With that said, we are starting to get into the potential area of diminishing returns, specifically for haste. Uh, at the end of Shadowlands, they put a new thing in where uh, essentially there's penalties after you get to certain break points. I'm going to put them on the screen. From 30 to 39%, there's a 10% penalty. And from 39 to 47%, there's a 20% penalty on haste value. So what this means is if you start getting near 47% haste, which on the PTR right now, I'm already at 38% and I'm only 480 eye level, which we will be higher than this uh, because all of my tier gear is not there. Granted, I don't think you're going to hit 47%. However, I just want to make you guys aware, once you start getting near 47% haste, you should absolutely start putting it towards other things. Um, I use an add-on called True Stat Values that helps me show how many points I'm losing um, for that, like, specifically for those points if I start getting into diminishing returns. Highly recommend it. Definitely check it out. It just gives you quick, good information about all the information. It's not something that I think is going to be super important, but just, you know, not aiming for a certain amount. Just if you start getting towards 47% haste baseline, not with PI, not with uh, Bloodlust or anything like that, just baseline, definitely start putting those towards more mastery and then picking up some more crit. Uh, I personally like to run a little bit more crit on Tyrannical Weeks and a little bit more mastery on Fortified Weeks, but early on, just... Haste mastery for everything until you start getting into sections or categories where you start making some like really nice, like little decisions at the end of the expansion. But that should be fine. You shouldn't have to worry about that too much. Before jumping to crafted gear and trinkets, I want to quickly go over the new gear upgrade system in case you aren't familiar with it. And since it did get a couple changes from last patch, every piece of higher end gear that you acquire from some open world things, Mythic Plus, Raid, and PvP can be upgraded, each with a different upgrade track that has a max eye level depending on the difficulty of where it was acquired from. There are six different upgrade tracks. Explorer is the base, which can be upgraded from 415 to 437, and then Adventurer from 428 to 450, which these two will be from world activities and other like lower difficulty things, such as like world events and things like that. The last four tracks are from in-game content and scale with eye level in difficulty. Veteran is from plus two to eight keys and LFR items, and it goes from 441 to 463. Champion is from plus nine to 16 and normal raid, and gives 454 to 476. Hero, which is 17 to 20, and heroic raid items goes 467 to 483. And then the last one, Mythic Track, goes from 16 to 20 vault rewards, and Mythic Raid items, which is 480 to 489. Also, while you are doing different content, you will acquire the items to upgrade these gear that are called crests. These have seen a really nice couple of changes from the last season. First, they no longer take up space in your bag. Thank you for that. And they're in your currency tab. Also, instead of gathering the fragments and turning them into the crests, you just gather entire crests. There are four different crests, Welpling, Drake, Worm, and Aspect, each gathered from Raid, Higher and Mythic Plus, and Raided PvP. There is a cap on how many of these you can earn each week that will increase weekly, so in case you don't hit the cap, it doesn't matter. It'll just continue to rise. You'll, you'll never have to worry about that. This also works for alts, so make sure you choose wisely on what you want to spend these on. You'll also be able to trade in crests for lower crests, and in 10.2, you can trade in lower crests for higher crests as well. You'll then use these crests to upgrade different gear tracks along with some flight stones. At the item upgrade NPC, there's a few locator on the Dragon Isles and in the new zone. Uh, the easiest one's just in Valdrak and the other training dummies. For any slot of gear, when you obtain uh, a higher item level from drops or upgrading, all of your upgrades will be discounted by 60% for flight stones and cost no crests. You also use these crests to upgrade crafted gear. You do need to get an order from an enchanter or make it yourself. 
uh, for an enchanted version. It costs a few mats, not too bad. I know I'm very briefly going over this, so if you want more information or anything I didn't cover, I'll put a link to the Wowhead article in the description below. So, let's starting off with crafted gear. Uh, I will probably be crafting weapon first, as usual. Haste mastery, by the way. All crafted gear, haste mastery, almost everything haste mastery, unless you get to 47% haste or something like that, which I don't think we're gonna be anywhere. We're gonna be kind of close, but probably not that close for a while. Before you craft your weapon, um, if you're gonna be raiding or doing keys, especially if you're gonna be raiding, there is a very rare item from the raid off of uh, one of the, like, the middle bosses that is a haste mastery staff, which is really good for us, and it has this on use that does a bunch of damage, and it pairs with this other trinket, where essentially, you, if you're a target's immobilized or whatever, and you use this thing that does a bunch of damage, and then it gives you a bunch of mastery, and this immobilizes targets, and then this can do some more damage to whatever. However, like, this on use, even without this trinket, is just going to be free extra damage in keys. So if you can get your hands on one of these, I actually think this is going to be pretty solid. It's Even if it's going to be a little eye level behind um, than, like, a crafted item, this is probably still going to be pretty good, especially early on, um, just because it's going to be a bunch of extra da free damage. But... Then I'm going to craft weapon uh, if I don't get that or if I don't get one out of my vault week one. I'll probably be waiting until my vault week one to craft a, to craft a weapon because I'm going to be pushing keys. So if you're going to be pushing keys, maybe wait. See if you get a weapon in your vault. Maybe get a little lucky. Um, if you're not, probably weapon first. You can either do one-hander or you can wait until you can craft a two-hander and then, you know, go haste mastery like I talked about before. Then go all of your off pieces. Also haste mastery. Um... But be careful because we're gonna get the we're gonna get the creation catalyst week one, meaning you can turn a piece of gear into tier very very early. So if you're doing the raid, try and think really carefully about what you want to turn into tier, and don't craft anything that you're gonna put on a tier spot that you're gonna replace with tier, right? So I would highly recommend crafting a like main item unless you're gonna be able to replace it with a higher item level piece, you know, something from the raid or something like that, or something from your vault. So I'm probably going to be crafting shoulders since they drop off the later end bosses. Um, but I'll be doing that after I end up getting my four piece online and after I get the 2k token. So if you hit 2k in, uh, in, in Mythic Plus or you get AOTC in the raid, you get a token that gives you one free heroic uh, tier piece. So if you're going to be pushing keys or you're going to be doing AOTC... Again, maybe be a little like lenient on where you're going to craft pieces. Granted, this is something you're going to be doing over the several weeks, right? Because we're not going to be not going to be able to craft gear immediately. But something to be very aware of with your tier. There is a new embellishment called Verdant Conduit. Spells and abilities sometimes provide secondary stats. I personally haven't gotten to test this thing. We we'll get two of them, and it's going to be pretty solid for Affliction because at 486 item level, it gives us 339 of a random secondary stat for 10 seconds. And then for each nearby ally tethered to the dream, I'm assuming meaning anybody who's running one of the three dream embellishments, then that bonus will grow more powerful, which I don't know exactly how much that means because I haven't gotten to test this, like I said. But that's a substantial amount of secondary stats that will have two of these embellishments running at a time. I have a feeling this is going to be extremely solid for Affliction. Affliction really, really likes secondary stats. Um, especially, I'm going to be playing Human. Human's got a passive racial that gives you more secondary stats, 2% more uh, from all secondary sources. So this will probably be even better if you're playing Human Affliction next uh, next season, which I will be doing in it. Side note, human's very good in Mythic Plus uh, for damage. Dwarf Racial's still really, really good, but definitely something to be aware of. Shadow Flame isn't terrible. It did get nerfed by 35%. It's not terrible. The other one that I think is pretty solid is Azure Weave. So uh, in the past, I didn't really like running Azure Weave, except now um, with Shadow Flame being nerfed and us being a little uncertain about the Vernon Conduit embellishment, Azure Weave might actually be a really solid option. It gives about 800 intellect when it procs, and it procs a lot. So... Um, definitely keep an eye on that, but I still think it's gonna be Verdant Conduit as our main embellishment. If anything changes, I'll definitely update you guys. I'll put a little note in the in the pinned comments down below, um, or you know, join the Discord, come by the stream, all that kind of stuff. I'll be answering all these questions if you have any questions. But I have a feeling that's what we're gonna be running. So with that said, I will probably be still crafting double Verdant Conduit, and I would probably recommend that as well. Um, Shadow Flame will probably still be okay from my testing on PTR. It was still fine, um, not as good as I think it could be. Obviously, it got nerfed by thirty five percent. And I think it's behind Azure Weave now, since Azure Weave did not get nerfed. Um, but since we haven't gotten to test that new Verdant Conduit, it's hard to say where Azure Weave versus that falls. However, I will still probably be falling towards Verdant Conduit as soon as we know more information about that, solely because Affliction scales really, really well with more secondary stats. Um, and then you're going to start wanting to craft your like off pieces and potentially one main piece with an embellishment on it. Um, 
but you might want to wait un until after you raid to see if you're going to get a tier piece. Um, because it might be better early to get your four set online and then change some stuff around instead of crafting something and then hoping you get a piece of tier. Um, so I will probably be crafting. I will always recommend to craft something that's on a main spot since you're going to have um, like a higher eye level at certain points. So I'm probably going to go shoulders again this tier um, and put embellishment on shoulders. And then I like to do embellishment on cloak. But that's the second one is totally up to you. Uh, so definitely depending on what tier pieces you get early, be careful of what you craft. But haste mastery for everything. And then put your embellishments on like um, shoulders or like um, if you want to do helm or like chest, that's totally fine. I probably am going to go shoulders though. All right, so let's talk about trinkets real quick. So there's uh, there's a few trinkets on the PTR and in next tier that we're going to get to play with. I've kind of narrowed down my favorite three, which is Pips pretty much is our new like icon. Or like if you played season one, it's icon. Or if you played season two, it's just like a passive stat trinket. Um, so basically, it's like it says, he gives us int. And then as we have it equipped, we kind of just cycle through these buffs. So you can see I'm currently friends with... Apparently it's bugged. I'm friends with two people right now, but uh, essentially you you get baseline stats, and then as you cast, you will get like a increased version of whatever one you're getting like the new stat version of. So you'll get 3200 crit or 3200 master or 3200 verse, and it kind of just like cycles through those. Uh, it's not like a you know it goes crit then verse then mastery. It kind of like can go like mastery and then crit and then mastery and then crit and then verse. You know it it kind of is all over the place. But this is just a pretty solid trinket. Just gives us free stats. As far as my on-use trinkets that I've been really enjoying, because I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I like to run as far as talents go, but I've been really enjoying Balefire Branch. Uh, it just gives us a bunch of mastery, and then when we use it, this is a 447 version, as you can see, which we're gonna have a much higher version than this. But uh, the 447 version on the PCR gives me 4400 intellect, which decays over 20 seconds, or if you take damage, right? But it's got that one minute 30 cooldown, which lines up really well with our new tier set, which I talked about before, right? Which every 30 seconds because we're running uh spoiler alert, we're running solar's gluttony pretty much all the time we have all of our main damage around soul rot and vile taint so every 30 seconds we have our damage so every one minute 30 we have big damage right that's our big opener and then every one minute 30 again um the other one that i like and also the other thing bellfire is farmable because it's in waycrest manor one of my favorite dungeons so you know easily farmable trinket that's always great one of the other ones that's pretty decent is this Ashes of the Amber Soul. This is a raid trinket, has a bunch of haste on it, and it does kind of a similar thing, except it's a two minute cooldown, uh, and then it gives you, you know, this is a 476 version, it gives you 5,000 you know, like basically for 20 seconds, decays every three seconds, and then when it ends, you lose 700 haste. So you basically lose the haste that's on the trinket, right? Which is, you know, it is what it is, uh, for 60 seconds, which is kind of bad in my opinion. However, it does have this like secondary effect where, like it says, when circumstances are dire or, you know, kind of like a cheat death, uh, you get the stat bonus. You get the 5,000 intellect and it can only happen once every two minutes, right? So there is some potential where you're getting this 5,000 intellect multiple times in a key if you're don't if you're dipping super, super low. Um, I don't remember what the exact health cutoff is. I think it might be like 20% or something like that. It might be even lower than that. I don't, I don't know exactly when the uh, activation period of this trinket happens, but... For me, the big downside of this is the set is losing the 700 haste. Like, because we're so 30 second damage cycle based now with Soul Rot and Vile Taint, losing 700 haste for essentially two full ramps or like two full damage windows, right? Are that's two Vile Taints and two Soul Rots. That's kind of a big deal in my opinion. And the only reason I would ever run this trinket is if you're also running Dark Lair, since it just lines up with a two minute. But even then, I'm still very iffy on this trinket. If you do happen to get one, um, definitely try it and definitely test it out for yourself because I have played on PTR and it's not, I don't think it's terrible, but the, the losing that amount of haste, I don't think is as good. Um, there's the new uh, beacon trinket, basically. I haven't really, I haven't really gotten too much use out of that in keys. Um, there is this like Time Thief's Gambit. This is from the Mega Dungeon. Um, that gives you a bunch of haste or whatever. I personally don't like this trinket at all. Um, the stun and the whole paradox thing. I, if you're used to playing this or you enjoy playing that, I don't personally think it's worth it though. I, I don't think that haste is worth it at all. Especially like I was talking about with the whole gear and stats thing. Uh, where we're starting to get into like weird haste values. I personally don't think this one's worth it. I'd much rather really have the intellect instead. 
This is the Unriveling Spindle that ties in with the staff, which might be very good in Mythic Plus. I haven't gotten to test its interaction with the staff and mobilize or all that kind of stuff, but the damage on it is pretty solid. The channeling is kind of weird, um, and the mastery is not bad for us at all, but again, I kind of would prefer to just have the intellect just straight up with Balefire Branch for me personally. Um, as far as other passive trinkets, the music box is okay. It's not anything compared to Pips. Um, same with C-Star. C-Star is fine. It gives us some more int every 15 seconds. The versatility on it, again, not great. I think this is a decent trinket um, until you get Pips. If you really don't have anything else, I think this is totally fine to run. The other thing I want to talk about briefly is the crafted trinkets. I don't think you should craft these early on, but if you're in a position where you just can't get Pips or whatever, these trinkets are really not that bad. Um, especially like the haste or mastery ones. Either one of these I think is pretty solid for, for affliction. I would probably go more towards the haste one, unless we're like, again, near that 47% haste marker. And then maybe I go for the mastery one. But I think a lot of people forget these even existed. And as far as trinkets are concerned this tier, I think that secondary trinket slot until you get pips is kind of like a little open. Uh, but those are my personal favorites right now. I did mention it briefly, they did nerf the class trinket a little bit from last tier. However, if you have one, early on we will continue to run that, that trinket for sure, 100%, and probably into a little bit until you get pips, or until you get something a little bit higher item level with a lot more int on it. But it still gives a substantial amount of int, so still run that if you have it, and still run Dark Lair for sure. All right, so I wanted to quickly go over how I like to sim for Mythic Plus specifically, since sometimes I think it's a little tricky. So first off, you're gonna wanna install the Sim C add-on under your WoW, and then you're gonna do slash Sim C in game, and that's gonna give you this string, and you'll just paste it in here on raid bots. And then what that's gonna do is just gonna load in everything you have in your bags and your current talent setup and all that good stuff. And then you can go down, you can select, you know, if you wanna maintain four set and how many catalyst charges, that's totally fine. That's not really what I'm gonna talk about here, but you know, this is just a, this is literally just a top gear Sim. This is what I recommend for when you're doing this. You can do quick Sim, all that kind of stuff. But uh, then you'll select, you know, whatever items you wanna compare, anything like that, trinkets, all that kind of stuff. The big one though that I like to do is set up multiple talent sets and then you can compare those, right? And then when we get down in here, this is where I really wanna talk about how I like to do this for Mythic Plus. So a lot of people use Dungeon Slice or talk about using Dungeon Slice for Mythic Plus. I personally don't like that and I would not recommend that because I don't think it's perfectly set up for Mythic Plus. You can absolutely use that if you want, but maybe run a few other ones and just compare the notes, right? So what I like to do is patchwork, one boss, and then I like to do the average in Mythic Plus for like a boss fight. So that's anywhere from like three to five minutes-ish, you know, depending on lust and if like the key level and things like that. So I'll usually do like three minutes, three to five minutes, and then uh, in between there. And then the big one that I like to do is I don't run any of the buffs. So I completely turn off bloodlust, I turn off everything. And then I give myself a baseline for what that fight's gonna be, right? So I can kind of compare things to it just as they are flat out. And then I'll do that again where I might turn on Bloodlust and things like that and I'll compare those two things uh, and just get an idea like, you know, some some talents might benefit a lot more than having Lust and things like that and the time, like the fight length, right? So for instance, Dark Lair might look really, really good on like a one minute fight because it's, you know, you're gonna have it for that. It's assuming you're gonna have it for that one minute. And then for AOE, what I like to do is I like to do five bosses and then like 40 seconds to simulate like a, like a trash pull, right? Just think of bosses as in mobs. So each pull, depending on the size and depending on how it's gonna be, you know, five bosses, 40-ish seconds, that's a pretty decent size pull on average in most keys. And then I'll do like, if I wanna do a larger pull, I'll do like eight to 10, and I'll do it for like a minute to a minute and a half-ish. Again, no lust, nothing like that. You can change your consumables and all that kind of stuff if you want to, but then that just helps give you a decent baseline to get an idea of what your damage is gonna look like in certain situations in Mythic Plus. So I hope that helps you guys out. I kind of just want to talk about briefly about how I like to sim for Mythic Plus. Feel free to mess around with this. It's not set in stone. Simulations are mainly just to give you an idea when comparing certain things or looking at certain things. But just, you know, depending on sim length and what talents, some talents might look better than others. So definitely keep that in mind. All right, so let's talk about talents real quick. Uh, I'm not going to go over every single talent, but I will go over some important ones that I think are something that I personally like to run for Mythic Plus. Um, and the, like just the overall build. So this is my overall favorite build right now, minus Wrath. I only run Wrath in a couple dungeons, I'll talk about that in a second, but 
as of right now, my favorite build is without Dark Lair. So I swapped Dark, this one Dark Lair point for Crescendo instead. But before we talk about these, um, pretty much I will take a point out of Fiendish Shride almost entirely to always go for Profane Bargain, specifically for the extra stam because we're always running Sacrifice, right? So that's one I want to talk about. I see a lot of people taking Fiendish Stride. Um, I personally like Profane Bargain. Not only does it help us with a little bit more of our, you know, our Soul Link or whatever, but the extra 5% stam from Sac isn't the worst thing. Um, the other thing, I, I know a lot of people like to take Mortal Coil. I personally like to take Howl of Terror. This isn't necessarily a you're doing something wrong or whatever. This is I think this is very like personal preference. Um, Howl of Terror does cap out on five targets. However, having another like AoE disorient or stop, in my opinion, is something that I prefer to have. But the heal on Mortal Coil is definitely not terrible. So I, this is something that I definitely think is uh, personal preference, but I personally like to run Hal instead. Um, I obviously will always suggest running Soul Burn, not only just for instant cast gateways, but there's a lot of cool tech you can do. I'll talk about it in the tips and tricks section. But uh, Soul Burning your Hellstone is really good. Soul Burning Teleport can be really good in certain situations as well. But that's kind of... I don't really change too much in our class tree anymore. Um, so... If you never played Warlock, you never played Affliction. Um, this is pretty much what I'm always running. Minus, you might move a couple points around and maybe go finish stride in like lower keys. But personally, this is kind of where I'm at. Uh, Fel Synergy is also another decent one. So you could take a point out of this and put it in Fel Synergy. Um, that's, that's another one that I like to run. So moving over to the main talents, though, my current favorite build for Mythic Plus is this exact build. Um, there hasn't been any situations that I've talked about or that I've found where I like to use swap yet. I am going to be making an updated tips and tricks video for every single dungeon. Um, and don't worry if there's a soul swap area, I'll talk to you guys about that. But until then, this is my current favorite build. We are still running sacrifice and it's only to get to soul rot and get down to this whole row specifically because sacrilash is bad. Um, I prefer to run dark harvest solely because having, uh, that, that amp in our window where everything for our tier is revolving around is just in my opinion the best um and then this is the floater point in my opinion so this point can be dark glare if you really wanted to i personally don't think it's worth it or this point can be wrath in certain dungeons i'll talk about which dungeons those are in a minute we will however continue to run dark glare if you were still running the class trinket after you replace the class trinket that's what i'm referring to here where i believe that point is a floater point um i personally prefer to run doom blossom over dread touch Almost always, I have yet to find a situation where I think Dread Touch is worth it. Even on Tyrannical, I don't think Dread Touch is worth it. I think you give up way too much with Doom Blossom. Xavier's Gambit is solid. Creeping Death is mandatory. Haunt is really, really good. Some people drop Haunt. I personally don't like to do that. Um, but Crescendo, almost always, for me personally, of all the testing I've done, Dark Glare is nowhere near as good as this one talent is, in my opinion, over the course of an entire key. Um, even if you were to run this entire row, I still don't know if it's better than Crescendo, if I'm being completely honest with you. Like, this whole row feels so bad now without Class Trinket. Um, Wrath is good in dungeons where you can maintain high uptime. So, uh, Waycrest, Atoll, the new Throne of the Tides actually is decent for maintaining, uh, Wrath uptime, and so is, uh, Dark Heart Thicket. Um, Black Rook Hold is okay. Basically, it's four out of the eight, I think, are decent Wrath uptime dungeons, so... But what I'm trying to say is this is pretty much what I prefer to run. And in this one talent point, you can kind of do whatever you want with it. Um, I've tried a bunch of different builds. I've even done like Haunted Soul with Grim Reach and all that kind of stuff. And um, like we talked about, Grand Walk Design did get a change. But there is, in my opinion, no world where you'd run these, these rows at all. Um, our entire tier revolves around Soul Rot. So lean into playing around Soul Rot. As always, the talent import codes are going to be in the description below and in my Discord, as well as I'll have an image in my Discord that has what builds I like to run for what dungeon. So be sure to join the Discord and if you want to get all that information easily or come by the stream. All right, so before I jump into the AoE rotation section, though, I want to talk a little bit about Rapture versus Seed of Corruption because this gets asked all the time. Uh, I didn't touch on it in my last guide, and I'm, that's definitely a mistake on my part. I ended up making a follow-up video, a frequently asked video about that, and I'll continue to make those if you guys have... If you have more questions that are not answered in this guide, please leave them in the comments below, by the way. Uh, I'm very happy to answer them. Join the Discord. I got a section in there, but I will absolutely make a frequently asked questions video that doesn't cover anything in this. But, essentially, Rapture does AoE damage since it hits all the targets that we have dots applied to. Um, it kind of does AoE damage, right? Because it, like, pulses all of them. So... It is a little tricky, but in my previous video, I said five plus targets is when I like to start using seed. 
Personally, in Mythic Plus though, that is more like four to five plus, especially when you're running Doom Blossom and with our new tier set, right? So with Doom Blossom, I think that we get a little bit more value as long as targets are gonna be alive for a decent amount of time to have, especially since we're 30 seconds now, Vile Taint, Soul Rot, Blossom on four targets, right? Um, especially if they're all kind of similar in health. If there's a priority target in a pack, say there's one that's like, you know, a very dangerous mob or one that has like significantly higher health, that should be your main target anyways, because if a target lives longer, you can just easily cleave everything off of there. Because our whole point, right, is main target, set a focus uh, on that main target, keep all of your haunt, your UA, and then spread all of your stuff from that main target. It's way easier that way. I'll talk about that when I jump into the actual rotation here. But that's the only time where I might weave in some raptures. Uh, like I said before, I like to run crescendo. So definitely be, whenever you're getting free crescendos when you're doing like your drain filler, ship those crescendos. Um, but the only time that I'll really spend raptures is anything under four targets. Or if like maybe you're pulling like five mobs and they start to spread out a little bit then maybe spend some raptures. Um, if you, with our new tier set, you do kind of have freedom to maybe spend some raptures to extend some dots. But personally, I think, especially if running Doom Blossom, it's better to just send the seeds. Um, but I kind of just wanted to quickly answer that because it gets, it gets asked all the time. So I'm going to say four plus is what I like to use, but it's like four to five, really. You know what I'm saying? Getting into the rotation. I'm going to start with single target and then I'm going to go over AOE. To simply explain it though, if you've never played Affliction before, the entire premise is to keep all of our dots on as many targets as we can that we can have as many dots on, right? So <laughs> essentially, there's a few of our dots who can be on as many targets as we want, Agony and Corruption and Siphon Life. And then there's a few that can only be on one target at a time. So like Haunt and UA can only really be on one target at a time, right? So in single target, the entire point of what you're trying to do is just maintain as many dots as you can and then squeeze in as many raptures as you can in that window of as many dots as you have on a target. So uh, when we have Vile Taint and Soul Rot on a target, not only are we activating our tier set bonus that is part of the new 10.2 tier set, but we're also making our Raptures hit as hard as they possibly can because our Rapture scales off of how many dots we have on the target. So jumping into it though, the opener is gonna look something like this. You're gonna do Haunt, you're gonna do UA, you're gonna do Agony, you're gonna do Corruption, you're gonna do Siphon Life, you're gonna drain for three stacks of Drain Soul, and then I'm gonna get some Crescendos here, I'm gonna save those. We're gonna do Vile Taint, Soul Rot, Trinket, Potion, you Dark Lair if you had it, spin these Raptures, getting these, spinning these shards right here, and then I'm hitting this, and I'm gonna catch this Nightfall before it falls, and then I'm just catching dots, right? I'm weaving in Raptures, as many I, as I can while I still have Soul Rot and Vile Taint up there, and then I'm catching dots in between those, right? And then we're gonna go back to just draining. Any Crescendos that we get, we're gonna just spin those, right? We got another one, spend it. And then we're just maintaining dots and we're, we can do this every 30 seconds minus the trinket and the potion, right? So every 30 seconds, that's kind of what we're doing. And we're coming back up, file taint, soul rot, refresh this UA, dump that rapture proc, right? Dumping the rapture, easy. All right, so for the AOE rotation, it changes a little bit. Ideally, you would open with a seed. However, when a tank is kind of grouping mobs up, Sometimes I like to pick my like focus target of what I'm gonna pick in the pack, like the higher health mob. And I'll try and ship like a UA and a haunt on that. Just if, as long as the tank's got aggro, I'll just ship that just so I'm ready. And then any nightfall procs you get in your AOE rotation, you're gonna wanna ship on your main target as well. Not only generate free crescendos, but also Shadows Embrace scales our Doom Blossom damage. So Doom Blossom scales increasing its damage based off of if it explodes off of our main target that has Shadows Embrace on it. So your opener's gonna look like something like this. I'm gonna do Haunt, I'm gonna do UA, and then I'm gonna throw this Seed, and then I'm gonna do a Vile Taint, a Soul Rot, a Siphon Life, Trinket Potion, and then I'm dumping Seeds in this window, right? As many Seeds as I can possibly get out in this Dark Harvest, I'm doing Drain as a filler, just trying to get this out there, as many as I possibly can, and then we're gonna start catching Dots. As soon as we come out of that, as long as we didn't use any Raptures, we need to catch as many of our Agnes as we can. Ideally, you wanna catch five. I'm gonna spend that wrap, that Crescendo as soon as I can. And then you're gonna notice our Soul Rot, and our Vile Taint coming back up real soon, right? So I'm gonna be ready for that. As soon as they come up, catch all these, ready ready for it. Vile Taint's back, ship the Soul Rot, ship this, and I'm shipping as many seeds as I possibly can in that Dark Harvest window, right? And that's the cycle. That's what we do every 30 seconds. That's what we're doing every single pull. Any crescendos we got, shipping it all right in that little window. 
All right, next up, I want to talk about my UI and not just my UI, but just things that you can do even for your own personal interface that uh, set yourself up for success and maybe might be hindering yourself uh, without you even really realizing it. Also, my entire UI is available in my Discord for free. Anything that I've made is available in my Discord for free. There's a few things that I use that I haven't made um, that are like readily available to everybody on Wake Up. There's a couple things um, that I have that are just part of my UI that are from now, but um, those are available to his, uh, subscription, to his subscribers. The easiest tip I can give is clutter. So my entire UI is designed to be very like minimal and clean and only show me the information that I want to see at any given moment, right? So majority of my bars and things that I can see on my screen are cooldown based or uptime based in the terms of like Siphon Life or UA or Haunt, right? It's like Haunt has a cooldown, but these other two don't have a cooldown, but I'm mainly just using them to track uptime and because I'm very used to where they are. Same with like Cedar Corruption, right? So the biggest thing though is just if you're trying to redo your user interface, not just no use mine, just you know move some things around, try and remove things off your screen that are just adding extra clutter and extra like distractions for you while you're trying to like do a key or whatever. It doesn't matter what you're doing, PVP or whatever. But if you have so many things all over your user interface that are just like super distracting, kind of tone that back a little bit. So jumping into my UI though, the base interface is all LVI. Um, I've been using LVI for a long time. I love LUI. This is my entire profile. Again, all of my stuff is available on my Discord for free. You don't have to be a subscriber or anything. Maybe hit the subscribe button, maybe come by and you know check out the Twitch and give a follow. But either way, anything that I've made available to you guys for free. Everything I've designed from the ground up to help me play Affliction and Mythic Plus and things that I've changed or made over the years that I feel like I wanted or maybe I saw that I thought was cool and maybe like changed a little bit that I, you know, that I thought was best for me as Affliction. So uh, LVI is fantastic. If you've never used it before, it's essentially an entire UI replacement. It has so many tools and little like things that you can change here and there to just have full control over what your UI looks like and what you want to do with it. So for me, that's something that I really enjoy um, and something that I am very particular about. So I'm very, very happy to be able to, you know, change every little detail as much as I want. Um, the next big one that I use is Plater for my nameplates. So in my previous guide, I talked about I used Now's nameplate profile. Uh, that has since changed. I have completely designed my own nameplate profile from the ground up, specifically for Affliction. Um, that's not to say it doesn't work for other specs. It works for everything, but it is mainly designed for Affliction. It has um, a pandemic glow that I edited. Um, so whenever your dots are getting ready to fall off at a certain time when you want to catch them for our pandemic invocation talent, uh, it'll alert you at that correct time. Uh, even if you're not running that talent, you should still, you should absolutely still catch your dots around there because you hit what's called a pandemic. So you extend your dots instead of overriding them. Um, we can get into that. Uh, it has a mythic plus renamer. This is mainly just to like shorten names. It just looks a little bit cleaner. Um, the big one though is cast targets on spells. So you can see what targets are being, what spells are being casted on what targets. And then the other big one is actually a script which tells me all my cast bars that I see on enemies are color coded. So, you know, a certain cast bar is pink if it needs to be kicked, right? Uh, one is yellow if it needs to be CC or interrupted. One is purple if it just needs to be CC'd, right? Um, you can change this however you want, but this is just something that I can quickly see on cast bar levels of, oh, I need to kick that. Oh, I should CC that, you know, stuff like that. Um, these are all made by Relo, by the way. You can import them into your own thing. Or I think I got these from Relo. I can't remember, but uh, I do run something from Relo, which I'll get into the next thing. But my player profile, also available in Discord for free. Um, if you play Affliction, I think having a nameplate profile is super, super important because the base one does not do a great job of giving you dot information. And usually it's like a pretty big hindrance on your play. So whether you're using Plater or uh, KUI or KUI or however it's pronounced or any other nameplate profile, whatever you want to use, um, I would highly recommend getting something for your nameplates if you're picking up Affliction because tracking your dots on nameplates is super, super important. The other thing that I like to track on my nameplates uh, is made by Relo. Uh, so shout out to that dude. His stuff is fantastic. I'm sure he'll do one for season three because he does one, it seems, for every season. Um, but I'll have a link to this in the Discord. I can also put a link to it in the description. But essentially, this will work on any, any nameplate profile or whatever. But it puts the cooldown of certain abilities on the nameplate of the mob in keys. This is super, super important to just quickly see 
you know, if there's an important thing that a mob is going to cast or do, you can see what the cooldown is of that ability on the nameplate of the mob, right? So if there's something you need to kick, it's going to happen in five seconds or whatever. This is just an easy way to track this on all your nameplates. Highly recommend that. I use OmniCD to track party cooldowns. That's what you're seeing right next to the nameplates of the party members. And then I also use it to track our kicks for the party too. So you can see whose kicks on cooldown. I can see who has what kick and how long until their kick comes back up. Uh, I'm also using Warp Deplete for my timer. So my favorite thing that it gives is it gives pull by pull count percentage. So if your tank pulls a specific amount of mobs, you can see how much that entire pull is worth to your total that you need. It basically just gives you quick information on what is happening in each pull and how much each pull is worth. And then obviously just easy to read timers. So jumping into the weak auras, the main one is that I run is something that I made, which I call an uptime bar, which basically just has all of the procs and things for every spec of Warlock that I like to track and be aware of, right? I'm constantly working on this. So, you know, those things that are getting added and removed and like Demo is definitely a spec I don't play as much. So there might be something missing that you track for Demo. Um, if you have something, you can absolutely leave me a comment or something like that and I can, you know, I'll add it. Um, but I try and keep all the affliction things that I like to watch. You can even see like Dread Touch and Rapture and Soul Swap Duration. These are all just have all durations and procs that you want to know about like in the moment that are just quick and simple to know like, this is up here, this is up here. And it's it's for, like I said, it's for destruction, it's for affliction, and it's for demo as well. Uh, it includes trinkets and things like that. Um, your health zone, all the good, all these goodies for that I things that I like to be aware of when I'm playing Warlock as well. Um, I do have a few other weak auras. I use stuff from now for his stuff. Like I said before, all of it's available to subscribers. So if you want little details and things, I don't use too much from now anymore, but all of his stuff is fantastic. His Mythic Plus stuff is great too. It is available to subscribers only, so definitely go check him out. Overall, my entire UI is designed to be clean and minimal and provide me with the information I need to know right now. Everything else is hidden away. Uh, I hide away all, like, all my instant casts are all on different bars and things like that. Things that I don't need to see are not on my screen. Um, and anything that I do need to see is on my screen. And that's just kind of the whole way I like to think about my UI. And I think that that's something that is really helpful, especially with a spec that is trying to keep track of so many things at, a give, at any given time that taking as much stuff off your screen you don't need to and giving yourself as much information on your screen that you do need is really important and really impactful. Like I said, don't have to use my UI, but use or you know make some changes to your UI to help yourself out and not struggle so much in a spec that is already pretty difficult. Jumping right into the tips and tricks. I always mention this, and it might sound obvious, but use your cooldowns. Shipping it instead of hanging on to it is almost always better, and even more this season since all of our damage is around Soul Rot, which is every 30 seconds. You should be using them as much as you possibly can. One of the biggest mistakes I see in keys, and have even done myself, is not using cooldowns enough. So if you're running Dark Glare, or even if you're not running Dark Glare, just ship it, and if it doesn't work out, or you maybe need it for another pull, make a mental note, go again. In higher coordinated groups, you'll plan on certain pulls where you might want to use cooldowns and trickets and things like that, but in lower keys and in non-coordinated groups, just ship it. I mentioned this in rotation, but it's also worth noting here. If you're playing the build I suggested, sinking Vile Taint and Soul Rot is super easy, but this is where you will always maximize Rapture value, so every time you're going, to, going into AoE or in a single target, try to make sure you have all of your dots on the main target, and ready for that small dark harvest window to really slam as many raptures or seeds as you can. It's definitely important for raptures, especially if you're running crescendo. Also, a note on this, it's worth holding three shards from when Soul Rot and Valtan are about four seconds away from cooldown, since so this is when you're gonna start your setup and get ready to dump as many shards as you possibly can. I know Affliction can be a bit daunting at first, especially in Mythic Plus. Sometimes there's just so much going on in a pull and it feels extremely overwhelming. So if you're wanting to get better and you're new to the spec, the best tip I can give you is to set a focus target on every pull and get used to managing the dots on that one mob. Keep your haunt and your UA on there and your agony and just be sure to watch those three since they're the most important and then branch everything out from that target. Don't worry about catching your agonies on the other mobs, just Vile Taint and Soul Rot, Seed of Corruption. And then when you get comfortable with that, then start to try and catch all the agonies on the other mobs up to like at least five. It's way better to focus on the mechanics that are happening and not standing in things and then trying to roll in as much more damage as you can in that situation instead of trying to do as much damage as you can and then standing in something and dying. You don't do any damage if you're dead. As Warlocks, we actually have some pretty solid utility, so make sure you use it. Use your kick whenever you can. I highly suggest getting a kick tracker like I talked about in the UI section, like Omni CD or something else. 
This season, though, there are a ton of important casting keys that need to be stopped. And since we have a pretty long kick, either try to play as a backup kick if your group hasn't really set a kick order, or just be really aware of as many important kicks as you can in the entirety of the dungeon this season. Also, don't be afraid to use Hal or Mortal Coil to stop casts, especially if you know it's something that's going to kill somebody. And then lastly, use your curses. A lot of people forget that we even have curses and don't use them, but Curse of Tongues alone is a fantastic utility in Mythic Plus. Because we don't have a long kick on certain mobs, using Curse of Tongues can actually help offset the fact that we're not able to kick as frequently and help our entire group out. Some of the mobs this season and bosses that I like to keep Curse of Tongues on are specifically Coven and Waycrest Manor. They spam cast the entire fight, so slowing down any of that damage is fantastic, especially for your healer, as well as Lady Waycrest. She is constantly casting from the stage, and while you target her, just keep an agony up to generate some extra free shards. Also, the triple boss fight in Everbloom, or the council fight, there's two mobs that are casting constantly in that fight, so I usually keep Curse of Tongues on at least one of them, specifically the one that's always casting heal, and then that way it just helps stop that cast as well. Any boss that has important casts, just try and make sure you maintain Curse of Tongues. It's really not that difficult. And then for some of the mobs I like to try and maintain Curse of Tongues on are any of the casters in Throne of Tide, specifically the Oracle. The Oracle has a heal and some other casts, but slowing down their cast is really important. Same with Waycrest. There's a ton of casters in Waycrest, specifically like the Thorn Shapers and any of like the mini bosses like Alma and Brindle, if you end up pulling those, just throw Curse of Tongues on there. It will help your group significantly. Any mob, again, that has some scary casts once you get more comfortable with the keys, I will be making a video going over any specific things that I want to talk about with for dungeon tips and tricks soon. But until then, any mob that you see is casting a lot, maybe consider just throwing Curse of Tongues on there. Also, Curse of Exhaustion is not to be forgotten about. It's a fantastic slow. We do automatically apply it with Vile Taint, so it can be super helpful. But I also use it on like the ads on Rawl in Waycrest Manor and on Spiteful Weeks to just throw it on the ghost so you don't have to be so afraid of them. Several of our pets have pretty strong utility as well. Sadly, we do sacrifice our dog so we don't get to use the purge, but if you're not running pet sack, use your purge. Imp Dispel is also fantastic. Usually I'll try and use it on situations like a boss fight that I know I'm not going to have to kick, and then I'll just bring Imp out and I can help Dispel. Sadly, it is only a magic Dispel, so it doesn't help with Afflicted. No matter what anybody says, it doesn't help with Afflicted, but it is still a pretty decent magic dispel on a very low cooldown, and it can help your group out in very specific situations. As warlocks, we're not really known for our mobility unless we're prepared for it. Teleport and gateway are huge tools, especially if you know where you want to go beforehand. Playing around your port can be a massive advantage in Mythic Plus, especially when combined with Soulburn, which increases your movement speed by 50% and makes you immune to roots and snares for 6 seconds after teleporting. So you need to do a little bit of a setup, but sometimes it can really prevent some mechanics from happening to you. While sometimes it's a little tricky to get that setup, it's still worth it. There's a few specific places I could talk about coming up next season I like to use it. In Everbloom, again on the three boss encounter, there's a tank ability that makes these like gigantic green circles spawn on the ground. It's really easy to just set up a teleport and teleport every single one of them. It lines up pretty well every time. On Entangling Weeks, you can also just drop your teleport right at your feet, move a little bit, teleport, and break the entangling instantly. It's super easy and it helps prevent you from having to move too much and you don't even have to soul burn to do it. Next season, there are a ton of fights that have small adds that give shards super easily, such as the strangling roots on Oakheart and Darkheart Thicket. You can dot these with agonies, since they don't need to be killed as long as you don't stand in them, nobody gets entangled by them. And you can generate shards off them easily and then when they're low, drain them to get an additional shard. This also helps us maintain Wrath of Consumption super easy on that fight and in this dungeon as a whole. There are a lot of situations like this in a ton of the dungeons, so be sure you're looking out for those since we really struggle to generate shards normally. This really helps. All right, guys, that about wraps it up. So I put a ton of work into this one, and I really hope it helps you out. And if it did, maybe consider hitting the subscribe button and the like. And if there's anything that I missed or any other questions you might have, leave a comment, join the Discord, come by the stream, all that good stuff. And hey, if you just want to hang out and watch some live Affliction Keys this season, the stream's definitely a great spot for it. I'm going to continue to upload videos all season long over here, especially Affliction Keys. So if you like that, you know exactly where the place to get it. Also, I made some designs myself. So if you want to help support me, check out broomnight.com, like this shirt right here, Buff Affliction. There's a few other ones on there as well. Check it all out. I made all of them and it helps support me if you support the content. So I appreciate that. I have a lot more videos coming real soon. So until then, thank you so much for all the support and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.